In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go before us, O Lord, we beseech thee in all of our actions by thy gracious inspiration, and further us with thy continual help, that every prayer and work of ours may be given from thee, and by thee be duly completed. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, good morning. Good morning. Let's jump in. Uh, so we started talking about the church last time. Uh, undoubtedly, the church was the biggest topic theologically in the 20th century. Um, and it, it eclipsed the Second Vatican Council in terms of a topic. You remember the First Vatican Council in the mid-1800s was about the head of the church, namely the Holy Father, the Pope, uh, as well as the nature of faith and its relationship with reason. So those were some of the topics then. Uh, but in the 20th century, you know, theologians kept kind of coming back to the idea of the church. And you started getting either novel and heretical ideas that had to be you know, kind of fought back, or just people deepening our knowledge of the church. And so it's, um, it is kind of complicated. It's a little bit complicated. I get that. Um, but doesn't mean we can't say anything. Can't, doesn't mean we can't say nothing about it. Sorry for the double or triple negative there. Um, but uh, at any rate, let's continue. Uh, I believe we got to the subsection, the church, the people of God, body of Christ, temple of the Holy Spirit. That's number 153. Is that where we uh, ended? So, and just by means of a preface for this section, we're going to try to get through a good chunk of it. Um, Obviously, there are different Christian denominations, different Christian churches, and I just want to preface this by saying, if we're talking about differences, please don't interpret that as I'm saying that somebody else's mother is ugly. I'm not saying that. Okay, we're talking, you know, if we're, if we're charitable, we're going to acknowledge the differences. We're not going to gloss over them. When has it ever worked out for you guys within your families to gloss over the differences between you and your spouse? And not, like, look at the elephant in the room. Uh, it doesn't work, okay? So we address the truth, but, of course, always in charity. Truth and charity. They go hand in hand, um, and that's, that's the spirit in which I approach this topic. So um, I don't have an animus against Protestants or Jews or Muslims or whatever. It's just, but we do have to talk about, we have to acknowledge differences. We can acknowledge the similarities. That's fine. Let's talk about those. But... Let's talk about the differences, too, okay, um, and, and try to come to the truth of what Christ taught us. That's the ultimate. It's not to win an argument. That is not the goal. The goal is to know the truth, to learn the truth, and with humility to accept it, and with boldness proclaim it. Um, it's that simple, because the truth reflects reality, which is ultimately God, so we can get really, really deep into that, but... Um, the devil is a liar. He sees the truth, he sees reality, and he says no. So we have to serve the truth. Um, your doctor is going to tell you the truth of your diagnosis. Okay. All right, let's jump in. So 153. Uh, we're going to look into how the church is considered the people of God, but also the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit. There are different images used for the church because it, it's coming at it from a different angle. Because, again, it's a kind of a complicated topic, the church. Okay? Um, the church is the people of God because it pleased God to sanctify and save men, not in isolation, but by making them into one people gathered together by the unity of uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right. So, again, I keep coming back to let's avoid extremes. And uh, one set of extremes that we need to avoid in, for various reasons is individualism versus collectivism, okay? Um, that would be, and you can see it even in the secular life, like hyper, um, this would be like the um, uh, uh, Atlas Shrugged. Again, I'm not condemning that complete philosophy, but uh, Ayn Rand was reacting to co the collectivism of the Soviets. All right, the Soviets like took over her father's uh, pharmacy or whatever it was, and just ripped out, hit, ripped away from him his own hard work. 
uh, in the name of the state, in the name of the collective. And so she just said, all right, I will go to the exact opposite extreme and just overemphasize the individual to the neglect of the group. But we can't, we, there's, there, I'm not saying you have to be right in the middle between communism and Ayn Rand, but uh, that's just an example of the individual is important, he has inalienable rights, he needs to be respected, but also we aren't little islands unto ourselves. We live in a community. So if you're dumping toxic waste upstream from another community, that's a problem. Okay, so uh, and the same in the church and in the spiritual life. Uh, you'll see extremes, more so on this side, on the individual side. Like, I don't need a church. I go to Jesus. Okay, like, I get the point. Because they're reacting maybe against um, maybe a heartless kind of collectivism. Oh, you know, maybe somebody, they, they caricature somebody in their mind. They say, oh, well, this person goes to church, but they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. They just kind of go through motions. They're seen at church. Uh, they kind of, they, they're active in different things and stuff like that. But they don't know Jesus. All right. Obviously, we don't have to do an either or here. We can have a personal relationship with Christ our Lord, and we must. But we also have to recognize we're part of his body, okay? The last time I checked, the billions of cells in my body aren't living independent from each other. They are very much together. Just like, think of the persons of the Blessed Trinity. There's distinction, but there's also true unity. Three and one, all right? So we need to lay in somewhere right there, okay? And so the people of God, does the Catholic Church believe that the church is the people of God? Absolutely. You're talking about a collection of individuals, okay? And we're not talking about another, uh, sorry, th these are important. Um, I, it, they feel like tangents, but I do think they're important. Um, we can have the, I don't want to put it, the human versus the divine the visible, ah, I may have mixed it up. It doesn't matter. Visible versus the invisible, okay? The, or in this case, you know, people versus maybe buildings, okay? And so there's a, but ultimately Christ is both human and divine. He's both visible and invisible, Okay, he is a person and he is collecting to himself people, but it is a society. It's a true society and that society is going to be manifest, not in a silly building. Like this building didn't exist 50 years ago and it may not exist 500 years from now. So this individual building or even St. Peter's Basilica, that didn't always exist. So, but we can't sit here and say buildings are unimportant. Of course, buildings are important. Think of how important the temple was to the Jews. Okay, These were inanimate objects, stones, but nonetheless, they were glorified. Uh, they were given dignity because of God who dwelled therein. All right? So it's not an either or. Um, so is the church the people? And this was a big thing after Vatican II. It's like, well, the church is no longer the hierarchy. It's the people. Like, why are you drawing a dichotomy against that? It's like head against body. That doesn't make any sense. It's both. You have a juridic body. You have a hierarchy. You have a visible structure. You have an organizing principle. But the hierarchy doesn't exist unto itself or for itself. It's here to serve, just as Christ came to serve. To serve what? To serve whom? That is the people. So you got to have both. So, anyway, I just want to... Be clear, right off the bat, we have to avoid extremes, because that's where error lies, okay, in extremes. Uh, la, la, la. All right, so here's an example. We're not saved by isolation. The image that I have in my mind, I keep coming back to the Titanic, all right, it's going down, that's fallen humanity, and instead of there being a number of lifeboats, there's one lifeboat, all right, that's the church, all right, made of the wood of his cross, okay? And so, how are we saved? We are saved individually, yes. You pull one person out of the water at a time, okay? But you're also saved as a community. You stay in the lifeboat. 
you leave the lifeboat because you don't like the, how the guy next to you smells, good luck in the icy North Atlantic waters. Okay, that's what happens when you leave the church. Um, and good luck finding a better place than in that lifeboat. Imagine how Noah's Ark smelled, by the way. That would have been vile. But would you rather be anywhere else? Well, sure, dry land, but that's neither here nor there. All right, so we're saved both individually, being pulled in individually, but we're also saved collectively by being part of this, this ship, the Bark of Peter, this little boat. 154, what are the characteristics of the people of God? One becomes a member of this people through faith in Christ and baptism. Do you hear both and there? Faith and baptism. Faith, which is a divine thing, an invisible thing, okay, that's important. But we also have bodies. We need physical stuff. We need sacraments with, uh, with material element to it. And so we have visible waters of baptism. Um, see, this is where things get mixed up here. Because you're baptized into a community. Individual faith in Christ is precisely that, individual, right? That's good, that's important, but you're also part of a body of people. It's a both and. And so you're baptized into the same faith as the rest of the church. This people has for its origin God the Father, for its head, Jesus Christ. The Pope is only the, the, his vicar. The true head of the church is Jesus Christ himself. For its hallmark the dignity and freedom of the sons of God, for its law, the new commandment of love, for its mission to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. I would have said to save souls, but whatever. For its destiny, the kingdom of God already begun on earth. Okay. Um, yeah, let's just keep going. Uh, 155. In what way does the people of God share in the three functions of Christ? as priest, prophet, and king. All right. Um, people of God participate in Christ's priestly office. That is, any baptized member of the faithful we're talking about. We're not talking about ordained priests. They participate in this priestly office insofar as they are baptized, uh, they, as the baptized are consecrated by the Holy Spirit to offer spiritual sacrifices. All right. So the difference between now, I'm one of the uh, baptized faithful as well, okay? And so I offer spiritual sacrifice as well, just as an individual. But as a priest, I'm able to offer the sacrifice of Christ to renew his sacrifice on the altar. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about holy orders later on, okay? That's, so we offer different sacrifices, not by degree, but by kind, okay? I'm able to renew the sacrifice of Christ on the altar as a priest, but there's also the, the priesthood of the baptized. And what, so a priest does what? He offers sacrifice. So a baptized member of the faithful, what sacrifice do you offer? Yourselves. Spiritual sacrifices. Um, you offer it up, as it were, as a member of the baptized faithful, participating in truly a priestly office of Christ. But that was another false dichotomy, well, during the Protestant Reformation and then after Vatican II. It was, we need to emphasize only the clerical priesthood, you know, and never talk about the priesthood of the faithful. Um, or we completely neglect that and we just focus almost exclusively on the faithful. And so, so then you started blurring lines after Vatican II, between priest and faithful. And that wasn't good. Because they are different things. They are, well, just like the Holy Trinity, united, both are important, but distinct. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. All right? The ordained priesthood is not the same as the baptismal priesthood. They are distinct, but both are important. Both have their place. And so, once again, we find we, the, the proper place in the middle. Clerical priesthood has its place. It is important. Without the priesthood, you don't have the Eucharist. You don't have the church. That's pretty important. But at the same time, it's always been preferred that a priest offer Mass with people there. 
Remember, the priesthood is for the people. Christ our Lord said, I've come not to be served, but to serve. Okay, that is his flock, his people. And so they, as part of the body of Christ, they offer up a sacrifice as well. And this goes into, what do you do at Mass? All right, so we talked about this, I think, a little bit before when we were talking about the Trinity. If the Son of God, if Christ, if what he does is offer himself to the Father for all eternity, and then when he takes on human nature, he becomes one of us, he continues offering himself to the Father, self-gift, offering, all right? That's the core of the priesthood of Christ, the offering of himself. And he does so principally from the cross. But by giving us the Mass and being able to allow you and me to be present at the Mass as John and the Blessed Mother were present at the crucifixion, he's allowing us, if he's the head, we're the body. And when we go to Mass, we participate in his sacrifice, and we too offer ourselves. It's one action, joined with Christ. Now, I as a priest stand in the person of Christ the head, and I'm offering the sacrifice of Christ, but you all are present there too. And you are offering yourselves to the Father. That is what divine worship is. The offering of yourself in union with Christ to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit that unites all of us. Us to each other and ultimately in Christ. So that's the priestly office. Uh, and so you not only do that at Mass, but in your lives. You guys go out into the world, into your families, into your workplaces, and you offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are there. The annoying co-worker, the long-suffering child, whatever the case may be, you offer everything back to God. What do you have that you didn't ultimately receive from God? Answer me that. I'll give you a Benjamin right now. Okay, Okay. so if you've received everything from God, you give everything back to God. That's the point. All right, y'all, we all share in Christ's prophetic office with the, uh, when with a supernatural sense of faith, we adhere unfailingly to that faith and deepen their, uh, our understanding and witness to it. All right, so by believing wholeheartedly uh and proclaiming in a state that's property or state in life uh, that you're, you're participating in the prophetic office of Christ. This last one's a bit nebulous. Uh, the people of God share in the kingly office by means of service, imitating Jesus Christ, who is king of the universe, made himself the servant of all, especially the poor and the suffering. I don't know. I'd have to sit down with a glass of something and think about that for a while. Um, because as parents, you have true authority, right, over children. Um, and maybe insofar as you do that as a good Christian, you're exercising your, your kingly. I'd have to think about that for a while and look up some more stuff. Anyway, let's keep going. In what way is the church the body of Christ? Okay. So, yeah, all right, let's just go. The risen Christ unify, unites his faithful people to himself in an intimate way by means of the Holy Spirit. In this way, those who believe in Christ, inasmuch as they are close to him, especially in the Eucharist, are united among themselves in charity. They form one body, the church, whose unity is experienced in the, in the diversity of its members and its functions. Okay, um, so if the people of God as an image, yes, it, it kind of is capturing the collective, but also... Uh, the individual. Um, the body of Christ, the church is the body of Christ, kind of does the same as well, but emphasizing a little bit more on the collective side. That uh, we're part of... How often do you think of your pinky and your kidney as something separate from you or from each other? Like, we have a unity in our body, uh, even though they are distinct, okay? Uh, distinct, but uh, united. And so, at any rate, that unity comes... By the way, not from us. We are not the origin of our unity. It is the Holy Spirit. All this is above what we're capable of. And unfortunately, there's been too much of an emphasis 
on the human these last decades, and especially at the human, we as the source, for instance, of our own unity. And that's not the case. Um, for instance, I'll, just by one example. Uh, after the Second Vatican Council, they introduced what's called concelebration. So priests, multiple priests offering the same mass. Now, theologically, I have a lot of problems with it. The church formally had condemned it uh, because there are a lot of difficulties, especially if each priest is, is receiving a separate stipend but offering the same mass. In my mind, that's a problem. I've never taken a stipend for a concelebrated mass, and I've just said, Lord, whatever you want, to, want me to do here, I'm doing. But um, in the last decades, a few decades, there's been this overemphasis on the need for priests to concelebrate instead of offering their own private masses. Okay, because there's this, I think, uh, this understanding that unity comes from us and what we do physically, as opposed to something more profound, more, um, uh, more deeper um, from the Holy Spirit. And so you'll get some priests who get like really angry at you uh, if you don't can celebrate, you know, if, and so I usually uh, offer my own private mass uh, instead of can celebrating. Because this, because of this principle, that's the Holy Spirit that unites the priesthood together. We don't have to be physically doing something together. Not that doing something physically together is a bad thing. Again, we, let's not do extremes here. But anyway, but that's just that's the first example that comes to my mind. Um, or sometimes you've gone to a mass and the priest will say, "Everybody gather around the altar to reflect the unity." Like no. No, we don't do that. <laughs> the unity is something invisible. And it's something on the level of charity. It's not making people feel uncomfortable and standing around an altar. All right, let's keep going before I go into a rant. Um, so the Holy Spirit, yeah. All right. Uh, 157, who is the head of this body? Christ. Okay. Uh, the Pope stands in his place as the visible head of the church. But the invisible head, the ultimate head of the church, is Christ himself. Okay? We need to remember that sometimes. Um, 158. Why is the church called the bride of Christ? All right, so we have yet another image. She's called the bride of Christ because the Lord himself called her um, spouse. Okay? And she's a fruitful mother. Uh, through her activity, she brings children into this world, spiritual children. Um, the term body expresses the unity of the head with the members. The term bride emphasizes the distinction of the two in their personal relationship. All right. So there's a little bit of truth in both. So are we united with Christ as the church is the body and Christ is the head? Yeah. So there's an emphasis on that unity, which is good. We need that. Because Christ is truly with us. If we're in a state of grace, Christ is in our hearts. But Christ as the bridegroom, the church as the bride, uh, emphasizes the distinction between the two. That, that, that Christ, the bridegroom, comes to his bride. Especially at the wedding banquet of, of the Lamb, that is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And so there's a sense of us going to him. Um, like I said, it's, it's kind of difficult. It's not, you can't just put simple things around the church because it's capturing different realities. Maybe sort of like you as a, as a husband, as a wife, as a father, as a mother. Depends on what you want to emphasize. The unity of your family, the cohesion of your family, or the value of each individual member of the, fa of the family, or your relationship with your children versus your relationship with your spouse. So what you are, just as individuals, is a complicated thing, too. And so at any rate, this is, you know, when things are man-made, they look much more like a machine than a human body. The human body is beautiful, it flows, it, it, it's well, perfectly organized, etc. But it doesn't look like a dang machine. Neither does the church. The church is the body of Christ, she's the bride, and so... If you're going to create a church, man-made, it's going to look much more like, you know, a silly computer or box or machine or something. It's a little bit easier to capture, you know, as opposed to the reality of the church. But anyway, 
Why is the church, the 159, why is the church called the temple of the Holy Spirit? Uh, she is so called because the Holy Spirit resides in the body, which is the church, in her head and in her members. He also builds up the church in charity by the word of God, sacraments, virtues, charisms. So maybe the emphasis here is that building up, the, the act of building up. So, you know, Christ is the cornerstone. The apostles are the foundation, okay? And then each of us are stone, putting together this magnificent building that uh, will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So to, maybe that's the church throughout time as well. As individuals are added to the church throughout time, in the fullness of time, at the end of time, this edifice will be complete. The last stone will be put right in place. And that's when, you know, the curtains will, will fall. I don't know. See that image of the Holy Spirit being like the soul of the human body? I stole that from St. Augustine. There's your quote right there. Okay. Uh, 160, the charisms. What are the charisms? They are special gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are bestowed on individuals for the good of others, not for their own aggrandizement. The needs of the world, and in particular for the building up of the church. The discernment of the care of charisms is a responsibility of the magisterium. Okay, so what do we got going on there? So there are gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, that individuals will have, that they will be given them. Um, just by one example, not infrequently, exorcists will work with somebody who has a gift of, of reading souls, um, so somebody who has an inexplicable ability to know what's going on in somebody's soul. And for instance, you know, they'll say, you know, ask this person about their paternal grandfather and his involvement in the Masons, something like that. And they may unearth a Masonic curse. Okay. Um, now a lot of the exorcists themselves don't have spiritual gifts. Um, Brother Chad Ripper is probably the most famous American exorcist. He says he's like a plumber. He's like, I have no gifts. I just go in there. I do my job. I work with people who have these gifts, yeah. and, and they lead me. But at any rate, so they have gifts. So um, now we have to be careful with these. Um, we don't go seeking after them. We don't ignore them, one extreme. We don't make too much of them on the other extreme. You get some people who go chasing after uh, charisms. You know, and I mean, they're given to us, but you have to have that proper balance. Okay, they're given to us, and then it says that the responsibility of the magisterium, that is the teaching office of the church, um, ultimately, the hierarchy will be the judge. Um, because if a, if a charism is a gift for the good of the church, that in a way is a public thing. Okay, and just as a civil government has a right to, uh, uh, to regulate the common good, in, in whatever area, territory. So the hierarchy, if something is public, as soon as something goes public, the hierarchy has the right to moderate what's going on in the church. Otherwise, it'd be the Wild West. If everybody doing whatever they want, and there's no sheriff in town, and that's a problem. So the church basically is some, for Karen's um, charisms, it's the church's responsibility to determine when someone has it or has or yes, and you had recently in, was it Italy? It was in the news only a few weeks ago. The church judged a case of somebody claiming to have gifts, and they, they, they judged it as inauthentic or not worthy of um, people to follow or whatever. I don't know the particulars of the case. Uh, maybe somebody here does. I, I don't remember. But, you know, if you have somebody with a gift, with a, so you think of like, I'm trying to, with Padre Pio, I mean, he had all sorts of incredible gifts. Although those were usually individually sort of seen, like in the confessional, in individual conversation. So I don't know if this would apply to him or not, but I mean, at any rate. Um, was he the one that knew when you were lying or not telling the full truth? Yeah, in the confessional. Yeah. Which, you guys are lucky, I don't have that gift. So, <laughs> lie through your teeth. The Lord will know, but I won't know. <laughs> Like, oh, you sound like a great soul. Just say three Hail Marys and leave the door open. Can you give examples of charisms? So the reading of souls, for instance, uh, the, the thing with the, uh, the 
uh, the exorcists work with um, people who have gifts who can, who can know uh, what's going on in that person's life. Um, He's possessed or not. Well, yeah, yeah, but, but the, that, that knowledge of, for instance, uh, ask them about a trauma from an older cousin from their childhood, and that can help lead to you know, the, 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 uh, the healing and any sort of um, deliverance ministry thing. Um, you do have, I mean, prophecy. Uh, Catherine Ann Emmerich, uh, you prophesied about a number of things. I don't remember the church ever condemning her. I don't know if the church ever said if they judged her either way, but her works were published um, and I don't think condemned. So that might be another, so prophecy might be another one. I'm trying to think of others. Well, the institution of uh, different clerical orders and religious orders, when the magisterium has to decide if a person who has gotten a little flock of people together, if they're worthy of being a, you know, if they have a charism to, to be an order. That, that seems like, you know, because when, when Vatican II said that all of the orders, uh, you know, I'm thinking of the, female religious orders that, uh, that I, I grew up with, they had to go back to their charism. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that they use that term all the time. Well, I think... <sighs> Yeah, I don't. I, I think there's a distinction of those charisms versus individual gifts by the Holy Spirit um, for an individual. Because you know, here we're not talking about a religious order. Uh, you're just talking about all right. So, for instance, charism of the Franciscans is that of poverty. That's not like a supernatural gift, other than God giving a vocation, a supernatural vocation for somebody to enter that order with that particular charism of taking care of the poor. But taking care of the poor is not the same as, say, a prophecy. prophecy. Um, okay. All right, well, let's uh, jump into the next section. The church is one holy Catholic and apostolic. So we recall that, uh, I don't know if it's at the Council of Nicaea or Constantinople, but in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, uh, they expand from the, the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed just says, I believe in the Catholic Church. Um, the Nicene Creed has one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. So this is what we call the four marks of the church. It's how you identify the true church of Christ. All right? And so this is where we're going to get into um, more sensitive topics. Because there's a suggestion there, well, maybe there are false churches of Christ, or, or whatever. Or uh, churches with only partial truths, or... We'll jump into it. All right. So these are the four marks of the church of Christ. This church has to have these four elements. First of all, unity. Why is the church one? The church is one because she has as her source and exemplar the unity of the trinity of persons in one God. As her founder and head, Jesus Christ, we establish the unity of all people in one body. As her soul, the Holy Spirit unites all the faithful in communion with Christ. The church has but one faith, one sacramental life, one apostolic succession, one common hope, and one in the same charity. All right, so um, the unity we're talking about is rooted in the unity of the Holy Trinity. And think about the desire that Christ has to be united with each of us, both individually and collectively. All right, let's start with individually. How much unity do you think Christ desires between you individually and him? Probably total. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Lord, I'm going to give you 60% of my heart today. The other 40%, it's a me day. You're not getting that. Okay? That doesn't make any sense. He gave himself entirely to his Father. Um, there's perfect unity between him and the Father, and that's the type of unity. Father, as you and I are one, let them be one. John 17. Okay? And so that's the type of unity, perfect unity of mind and heart with him. But that also means with, with each other, but through him. So, in other words, if all of us are united to Christ, we will therefore be united with each other. And so the church, Christ establishes one church, he's not a polygamist, one bride, uh, and he desires perfect unity 
within her. Okay? Now, ultimately, that's not going to be had until heaven. If you read the New Testament, you read the letters of St. Paul, there was not perfect unity in the church on earth. Okay? Now, there was only one church. That was the Catholic church. That was the first church. But there were divisions between Jew and Greek, for instance. That was the biggest division. All right? But it's something that, uh, at any rate... Um, there needs to be perfect unity, okay? Now, uh, one, there needs to be one faith, as is mentioned, one sacramental life, so that's worship, okay? You know, you don't have some faithful with six sacraments and others with seven. And there needs to be one government, one apostolic uh, succession, okay? So that you're touching on both inv invisible things and visible things. This is why you have to have a hierarchy, uh, because it does reflect the human and the visible side of the church. Okay, But we also acknowledge that the church is divine. It's an invisible reality. It's principally in heaven. It, it breaks into this world. Okay, um, And so you have to have a hierarchy one structure, uh, because the church is still, I'm sorry, these things are all confused, uh, but you see the distinction. It's got to be a both and. So if we're a visible body of a church, and it, you know, we're an invisible, in, in visible reality, but we're also a visible reality, just as Christ was both uh, visible in his human nature and invisible in his divine nature. Okay? And so you have to have a governing structure for that visible aspect. Okay, we are a society, like any other society in the world, insofar as we look, we're an organization. We're in a building right now. We have electricity, etc. But unlike any other society in the world, we're divinely founded. <clears throat> and so we will last until the end of time, etc. So, anyway. All right, 162. Where does the one church of Christ subsist? The one church of Christ, as a society constituted and organized in the world, subsists in, that's subsistit in, the Catholic Church, governed by the successor of Peter and the bishops in communion with him. Only through this church can one obtain the fullness of the means of salvation, since the Lord has entrusted all the blessings of the new covenant to the Apostolic College alone, whose head is Peter. All right. So entire books are written on this phrase, subsisted in. That's a phrase used in Lumen Gentium, the Second Vatican Council. You know, what does that mean? And you get, um, you get different camps interpreting it different ways. Um, but uh, we don't need to go into all of that. Um, Remember, just by means of reminder, uh, our first class together, I actually started with the church, with the authority of the church, because it's the authority of this church by which I'm proclaiming this faith to you. So that's why I started there. Um, and we remember that the Father sends the Son into the world in order to redeem the world. The Son sends forth the 12 apostles uh, who receive, and the Holy Spirit, all right? Um, so he receives, he gives the, he gives the entire church the Holy Spirit, but by virtue of the Holy Spirit, he's giving authority. The authority that Christ received from his Father, he gives to his, uh, his apostles. Okay, as the Father has sent me, so I send you, and we'll talk about that in a second, Okay. Now, the apostles, uh, as we saw, are the 12, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, but one is the head, okay? And so Peter was given uh, unique authority because he is the prime minister, if you will, of the new covenant. So you remember in the old covenant, you had the king, so the Davidic king 
So in the line of David, you had the king who's assisted by an over the house. All right, that's his prime minister. That's his second in command. Just like Pharaoh and Joseph, okay, Joseph was second in command. And so if Pharaoh were away, Joseph was the final say. And so this, this position was a real position. It's in your Old Testament. Um, he's given keys to the house of David. Okay? Whatever he opens, none shall shut. Whatever he shuts, none shall open. That's from Isaiah 22. We talked about this. But there are also other ministers in the kingdom. Just like any other government, you have to have uh, government leaders. Okay? And so the recorder, the... Uh, there's like three or four explicit titles, uh, positions that are mentioned, but um, the other ministers. Okay, the king is anointed with oil. That's how he becomes king. And the queen is the queen mother. This is the exact structure that Christ our Lord ends up using. Okay, because Christ comes to fulfill this, this king. This, remember that this kingdom is promised to last forever. They're waiting 600 years because the lineage of the king seemed to have been snuffed out. So Christ, anointed by the Holy Spirit, is the anointed one. He's the Messiah. He's the Christos, the Christ. He is the king. This is why they want to go and make him king, although they're thinking an earthly kingdom. And so this is the structure of the church. Christ, who is the king, he appoints Peter. Uh, he gives him keys, just like this guy was given keys. Keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's legislative power. These are not empty words. And so when the king goes away at his ascension, somebody has to rule in his place. That's going to be Peter. And then you have the apostles, just as a group. But, of course, they're not going to live forever. So they are going to be replaced by the Pope, which just means father, daddy, papa, um, the Bishop of Rome, and the bishops of the world, in union with him. All right, so we don't just make this stuff up. And so we've had a 2,000-year um, lineage from Peter to today, Francis, or 265 or 66, I forget, successors or number of popes, whatever. Unbroken chain, unbroken line, okay, from Peter and the Apostles down to 2021 with Francis and the bishops of the world in union with him, okay? So that authority is going through time. Father. Yes. When did cardinals come to pass? I know it's strictly for the election of the Pope, but how long have there been? Uh, medieval period. So I want to say 900,000 years. Cardinals, it's just an office. Um, they can be done away with tomorrow, and it won't change the essential structure of the church. It's just a time. You don't even have to be a bishop to be a cardinal. Um, you could, they, they had uh, priests as cardinals before, and in theory, you could even have a layman as a, as a cardinal. So... Just it's just a title. It's just a title. It's just like um, that's their that's their chief position job to elect the pope, uh, but um, that's not their only job. Well, yeah. there's cardinals in areas within the country over very uh, multiple uh, dioceses. Is that true, or just over a diocese? Like, just one. Like Cardinal Dolan in New York. Yeah, so he's, he's just, only in New York, though. He's only in New York. Yeah. Does he have any authority there other than just he's here? I mean, In Rome? No, no, no. I mean, over the, the uh, Diocese of New York, does he have any authority as the cardinal that's in uh, New York? I mean, the bishop of that. He is the bishop. He's the oh, cardinal okay. archbishop oh, okay. of the Archdiocese okay. of New York. I so, see. yeah. And so a lot of times you know, when somebody's appointed, like he was just an archbishop when he went to New York. And so... 2008, I believe. So he was just the Archbishop of New York. You had the retired Cardinal Egan, um, but uh, and then at a certain point, he was uh, made a Cardinal. Mm -hmm. And the Pope appoints the Cardinals? He does. The Pope appoints the Cardinals. Mm -hmm. Is that a problem yet? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the Pope appoints the Cardinals. Yes. Yeah. 
That's a whole other thing. <laughs> yes, I do have an opinion on it. Um, all right, all right. So remember, this is the this is the fundamental structure of the church. It is deeply rooted in the Old Testament. It's fulfilled in the New Testament. We don't just make this stuff up. Okay, so what church did Christ found? He founded one church on Peter and the apostles. Now, by the year 100, that's being called the Catholic Church. And you'll see that um, in an upcoming paragraph on the next page. Yeah. As early as the year 100, it's being called the Catholic Church. Capital C, Catholic. All right. And so Christ founds this one church. Um and with the fullness of the means of salvation, so everything he wanted to give humanity for salvation, he gave to Peter and the apostles, and they gave to their successors. Okay. Now, there are some things, we will get to them, that kind of go to this. All right. Now, um, 163, we may come back to that. I'm not skipping it, but we may come back to that. Um all right, we're definitely coming back to 163 and 164, but let's, let's uh, tackle the other marks of the church, okay? So um, talk about the need for the church to be one, all right? And by the way, the visible point of unity is the Pope, all right? That's why the Pope can't be divided uh, against himself. And so, you know, so unity in the church is going to be both a visible and an invisible reality. I mean, we can all be private dissenters, private heretics. And I'm not going to see it in you. You're not going to see it in me. Okay? That's an invisible thing. Uh, the Lord knows how united you are to his teachings. But insofar as this is a church, and it's a visible reality, you have to have a visible source of unity. You have to have a visible source of unity, and that's going to be Peter and his successors, uh, the popes. Can I ask a question? Yes. Haven't there been some bad popes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Starting with Peter, yes. Yeah, none of them were, not a single one was perfect. Yeah, and so that's, uh, I mean, that's getting the issue of scandal, which we will talk about in the next section on holiness, okay? Um, all right, so you have a visible source of unity, okay? I would also argue that the pope needs to be united with the faith that has come before him. He needs to be united with the teachings of Jesus. Good, good idea. That's a whole other thing. All right, let's keep going. 165, because it's not his plaything, all right? The church is not his plaything. The faith is not his toy. The liturgy is not his toy. All right, 165. In what way is the church holy? See, a lot of people get mixed up on this one because you have a lot of bad eggs. Including, what is it, 27 eggs in this room, okay? If you're not a bag egg, please stand up, okay? <laughs> okay, we are all sinners. Um, but the church is still holy, so what do we mean by that? The church is holy insofar as the most holy God is her author. So her founder, Christ our Lord, is perfectly holy. So what he creates is something holy. Christ has given himself for her to sanctify her, to make her a source of sanctification. The Holy Spirit gives her life with charity. In the church, one finds the fullness of the means of salvation. Holiness is the, uh, is the vocation of each of her members and the purpose of all of her activities. All right. So we have the author is holy, therefore the church is holy. We have the purpose, the vocation of the church is holiness. This is our goal. This is why I'm doing this right here, right now, to help you understand the faith a little bit better. So, because the better you understand not only the faith, but ultimately Christ, the more you can love him. And the more you love him, the more you're going to conform your lives to him, and that is holiness. This is the point. It's not to rack up money in a bank account. It's not to build buildings. It's none of these things. I mean, these things are part of it. But the, all that, that's a far second to your holiness and mine. This is the purpose. So if you don't see a churchman stressing that, then give them to the birds. Uh, this is the purpose of the church, our holiness, our unity with Christ. The church counts among her members the Virgin Mary and numerous saints who are 
uh, her models and intercessors. The holiness of the church is the foundation of sanctification for her children, who here on earth recognize themselves as sinners ever in need of conversion and purification. All right, so you have the founder is holy, the purpose is holiness, and her members are holy. Now, again, not all of us, we're still works in progress, but we will be holy in heaven if we get there. That purification process in this life or in purgatory, to the extent that we're not purified in this life, we'll be completely holy before entering into heaven, because sin cannot enter into the presence of God. But we do have those members. By your fruits, you will know them, our Lord says. And the church is able to produce saints, the, the first of whom, of course, is the Blessed Mother. All right. So yeah, do we have a lot of bad, bad eggs? Absolutely. It's a stinky basket. But we also have the Mother Teresa's. Padre Pio's, Francis of Assisi's, um, and even Peter, who had his flaws. Okay, but at the end of his life, he was holy. By virtue of the, his crucifixion, mm -hmm. his his union with the sacrifice of Christ in his own body, he was purified, and that's why we celebrate him as a saint. That's why you know, for as scary as martyrdom is, holy cow. I will take that, you know, some person, terrorist, you know, putting a gun to your head. Do you, do you believe in Jesus Christ? I mean, that's, it's a scary thought, but so is purgatory. And, and, and if you say, yes, you go to heaven. If you say no, what happens? That's a problem. If you deny me, uh, then my, I will deny you before the Father. That's a problem. All right. So, but we are still, this is where the, the, the issue of the church is complicated, right? Because are we part of this church? Yeah, we are. But as, as, as a visible, yeah, we, 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 are, we are baptized Catholics, or we're in union with the church. But there's an invisible side too. To the degree that you guys have sin on your soul or I have sin on my soul, we are not in the church because we're not in union with Christ. And being in union with Christ means being in the church. That, so, that's an, so you see how this gets complicated. Mm -hmm. All right? So that's why we say the spotless bride of Christ, the sinless church, is made up of sinful members. <clears throat> it's a confusing thing, I know. But um, I think it really does reflect reality. All right. Now, 166, why is the church called Catholic? Catholic means universal. It's the Greek word for universal, okay? Um, and then I mentioned before, St. Ignatius of Antioch uses the phrase Catholic Church. Where there is Christ Jesus, there is the Catholic Church. He was a direct disciple of the apostles themselves. He was the second successor of St. Peter in Antioch. Okay, Peter was first in Syria, in Antioch, Syria, before he went to Rome. And so Ignatius uh, was his second successor there. Okay, so formed by the apostles themselves. So if you read his seven letters, you want to know what somebody who was taught by the apostles themselves, how he believed? Read Ignatius of Antioch. It is so unbelievably Catholic. Um, he talks about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. He talks about the structure of the church, that we ought to be obedient to the bishop as Christ is obedient to the Father. He had very strong emphasis on the unity of the church by means of being united to the bishop. He does flash him about, doesn't he? Who? The bishop. The bishop? No, ours is very meek and mild. <laughs> no, I don't mean ours. I'm talking about in general... I mean, at, at any rate, it, it shouldn't have to be that way because we should all be doing our job. But when there's something going on in the church and you need a source of unity, he is that source of unity. But Ignatius of Antioch, he talks about, yeah, the unity of the church is very important to him. Okay, um, now the church proclaims the fullness and the totality of the faith. All right, so when we mean by universal, we mean a couple things. One that it, it, it embraces all peoples, all right? The Catholic Church is not a European thing. 
It's not a Western civilization thing. It's not a Northern Hemisphere thing. It's not a literate uh, thing. It embraces anybody and everybody. <laughs> what I love about our faith is that you can have the intellect of a St. Thomas Aquinas, who literally is the brightest man probably ever walked the face of the earth, apart from our Lord. Um, or you can have a very simple farmer or a forest gump. And both can climb the heights of sanctity, which is the goal, right? It doesn't matter what gifts you have or don't have. That is a beautiful, beautiful thing about our faith. You know, St. Monica, the mother of St. Augustine, she wasn't highly educated. But she could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him because she had the Holy Spirit. Um, so, anyway. Um, but also, so it's embracing all peoples. But also embracing the fullness and the totality of the faith. So, in other words, you don't shun part of the teachings of Christ because our culture has gone woke. Okay? You embrace the fullness of Christ's teachings. Uh, she bears and ministers the fullness of the means of salvation. Okay, so it's another way. Um, she is sent out by Christ on a mission to the whole of the human race. All right. Now, 167, is the particular church Catholic? All right, so what do we mean by this? Every particular church, that is, every diocese or eparchy. Eparchy is a diocese, but in the Greek uh, Catholic world, okay? Remember that the Catholic Church is made up of actually 22 churches. The largest, by far, is the Latin Church. We are part of the Latin Church. Um, I'm pretty sure I have at least one member up in Highlands who is, he's got to be part of a, an Eastern Catholic Church because of the way that he crosses himself. All right, that's the Orthodox uh, Eastern Catholic way of crossing yourself. You know, we do it like this. They do it like this, okay? And so, and when I was in college for a year and a half, I went to a Ruthenian Byzantine Catholic Church. So it's 100% Catholic. We pray for the Pope, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's uh, coming from Eastern Europe, okay? And it's in full union with Rome. And so they are divided up, not by diocese, but by eparchy. So it's just a different word for diocese, okay, but for the Greeks. Um, so we are in the Diocese of Charlotte, cut North Carolina right down the middle, just east of Greensboro. Western half is Diocese of Charlotte. Uh, actually, this coming year is the 50th anniversary, not only of St. Jude's, but also the diocese. So we were carved out of the Diocese of Raleigh, okay? So the eastern half of the state is Raleigh, we're Charlotte. So this is what you call a particular church. And we have everything that you need in order to have a church. You have the head, which is the bishop. You have the sacraments being administered, the fullness of the faith being proclaimed, etc. All right? And so it's sort of a microcosm of the universal church. And that is a, this is a very fascinating topic. It comes up a lot with the Eastern Orthodox when we're having dialogue with the Eastern Orthodox how they understand particular church versus the universal church, okay? Um, so what Bishop Jugas is here in this particular church of Charlotte, Pope Francis is to the universal church, okay? That he has universal jurisdiction the way that Bishop Jugas has jurisdiction here. Um, all right, so a particular church. Um, it is formed by a community of Christians who are in communion who are in communion of faith and of the sacraments, both with their bishop, who is ordained in apostolic succession, and with the Church of Rome, which presides in charity. All right, so even back as far as 100, St. Ignatius is saying the Church of Rome presides over, is not put in charge of all the churches, but presides in charity, not in authoritarianism, but in charity. Uh, so we have to be in union with our local bishop, okay? Um, and again, if you struggle with that, just read Ignatius of Antioch. I mean, he goes on a tirade on this topic, um, how important that is. Okay. Um, who belongs to the Catholic Church? That's a loaded question. 
All human beings in various ways belong to or are ordered to the Catholic unity of the people of God. Fully incorporated into the Catholic Church are those who, possessing the Spirit of Christ, are joined to the Church by bonds of profession of faith, the sacraments, ecclesiastical government, and communion. The baptized who do not enjoy full Catholic unity are in a certain, although imperfect, communion with the Catholic Church. This is another complicated issue. Um, we have to avoid two extremes. I've said that once or twice. One extreme is what's called Feneism, actually named, it's a heresy named after an American priest in Massachusetts in the early 20th century, who basically said the only people who are in the church are baptized Catholics. The church actually has never believed that, all right? So uh, Homeboy decided to take a one extreme position. Now, the other extreme position is what came after Vatican II in, in large, large areas of the church, which is basic, basically called the, um, there's a very famous book, um, The Anonymous Christian, I think. So basically, we're all in communion with each other, just focusing on the uh, invisible thing and the visible unity that's really not important. Okay? And so that is another extreme, which is basically flirting with relativism. And relativism is there's no objective truth. You have your truth, I have my truth, whatever you want to believe, that's beautiful. I have what I want to believe, that's beautiful. One's not more beautiful than the other. But there's a problem because, yeah, either Jesus Christ existed or he didn't. Either he was crucified on a, on a cross or he wasn't. You know, the entire world believes that he did exist. He was a historical figure. And he died by crucifixion. Even your atheist, your Jew, um, your secularist. Okay, sure, this guy existed. Muslims, however, don't believe that he died on a cross. They, they, they don't believe that he was crucified. They say that's a lie. And so you can't have both positions. Relativism would say, okay, Mr. Muslim, uh, you don't think that Christ was crucified? That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, uh, that, that's true for you. I believe he was crucified. That's true for me. That's relativism, all right, which is not serving the truth. It's a lie from the devil. Um, and so you have a huge portions of the church who are relativists. I'd say even up until this day. Why? Because it's less offensive to say to your Muslim friend, I think you're wrong. Isn't Pope Francis kind of a relativist? That is a loaded question, Wes. <laughs> Way loaded question. I'm not going to answer it, okay? We don't have two hours. Um, we don't have two hours. So... Um, but that, that's the temptation, isn't it? And this is, again, avoiding two extremes. One extreme is to proclaim the truth without charity and say, all right, not only, Mr. Muslim, are you wrong, but your mom's ugly. <laughs> uh, but the other extreme is, you're okay, I'm okay, you have your truth, I have my truth, and that's it. All right? No, the truth in charity. All right, so, um, yes, those who are... Formally in the Catholic Church, they are in full communion with the Catholic Church. You're in the Catholic Church. Okay. Um, but we were talking about the other, well, what if I'm in a state of moral sin? Ooh. But that's an, invis that's an invisible thing. So we can't really comment on this. This is the problem. Only God can comment on what's going on interiorly. Okay. Am I truly in the church or am I not? Am I in a state of mortal sin or am I not? Like, I can't judge that in you, you can't judge that in, in me. Um, that's an invisible thing. Or the, uh, the pious um, uh, Pacific Islander who never heard the gospel. Okay? Uh, invisibly, what's going on there? Um, only God can tell. So we, just speaking on the more visible side, that's the only way we can speak on it right now. You have Catholics... But then you have, it's like, it's like rings of unity, um, maybe. Maybe that's not the best uh, example. So you have Catholics, 
and then very, very, very close are orthodox. And we are so close, people. We are so close. In fact, there's a difference between uh, schism versus heresy. Heresy, okay? Uh, heresy means the other, so somebody who believes something else. Oh, I believe in four persons of the Trinity. Okay, you're a heretic. Okay, that's something other, okay? There's no squaring that circle. A schism's not necessarily that you believe something different, it's just that you're not in union. Think of scissors, all right? Same root, I believe. Um, and so Catholics and Orthodox are in schism. Um, now, there are a couple of very small things we disagree upon. I'll just leave well, that. Just sorry, right, right. Yeah, so what, to what extent? They believe that the Pope is the first of the bishops, but what does that mean exactly? That's where we differ. Does he have universal jurisdiction or does he not? Can he go to Moscow and say to the Patriarch of Moscow, you're fired? Can he do that? We would say, yes, he has that jurisdiction. They would say, no, he doesn't have that jurisdiction. And so that gets into a whole, a whole thing. But we're pretty much just, we are the same. We are so close. Okay? Um, and then, anyway. And then you have, you have non-Catholic Christians. Now, even these non-Catholic Christians, some are going to be much closer some are going to be a little bit uh, further away. Um, in terms of how close are you to the fullness of the teachings of Christ and to his sacraments and to the grace, okay? Now, within the world of Protestantism, there are major differences. You have your, your Baptist, very low church Baptist, who just believe you just need to have faith in Jesus. And that's it. You don't even need to be baptized, you only do it as a perfunctory thing because Christ said to, but there's nothing inherently in it. All right, that's the Baptist position. Very, very simple, simplified form of the gospel. But then you have like really high church Anglicans who, are, who look a lot like us, who believe a lot like us, although there are some differences. For instance, thinking that the head of the country of England is somehow the head of the church. Um, that is a difference. Um, but they would be closer to us than our very low church Baptist friend, okay? But quite honestly, I feel almost more at home with a, a, a Bible-believing Baptist than a lot of people even in the hierarchy of the Catholic Church right now. But that's... Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, I just said that. I'm sorry. A little bit honest here today. Uh, people, I think we're, I mean, I can't wrap up the four marks of the church uh, with, you know, while doing justice to it. So, unfortunately, I think we do have to um, pause it there. Um, but I will, we will be coming back to 163 and 164. Okay? So, that's what, uh, that's what we're just going to have to do. There's no landing a plane. Sometimes you just got to crash it. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Through the intercession of Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.